We are people advocating cannabis education here at paceradio.net. The views expressed by the individuals during this broadcast are their own opinions, and they may not be the same as those of their group or other organizations they may be involved with. Hello everyone and welcome to the Pace Radio Show. It's March the 24th, 2021 and we are live here at paceradio.net. Tonight I am joined by my joint host, the co-owner and editor of Skunk Magazine, that's Julie Carello. And she has a special guest joining us for tonight's program that you won't want to miss. But first, it's time for me and Julie and Ed, as normal, have our little few minute gab. And Julie's going to update us on what's new with Skunk to what she's been busy doing. Right, Julie? Yeah, yeah, Al. How are you doing? Has spring uh, has spring begun over there in your neck of the woods uh, in Ontario, there, Canada? There is still snow in the woods. I can re- I can report that <laughs> to you. Okay, <laughs> there is still snow in the woods. Um, I've got a little bit of snow in my backyard, but not much. Okay. Yeah. So it's a, it's been a pretty pretty mild winter, I heard. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was. Um, you know, we did get some snow late in the winter there, uh, but uh, like this last week, you know, we we had some eighteen degree okay. day, eighteen degree day. So that'd be like, you know, sixty six degrees in your language, and uh, to us, it, <laughs> it felt great. <laughs> So, yes, yeah. 66. Okay, okay, yeah. I'm remembering now. There's still snow on the ground in May. Uh, in yeah, uh, there can be, eh? There can be. I know so, I know. Yeah. last year, Kim had that had the snow falling off her roof cont- contest up there in Kirkland Lake. And, like, uh, yeah. people were guessing, like, into May. And I know she's having another one this year, but I don't... She didn't get the same amount of snow as that she got uh, last winter. There's no doubt about that. Well, that's yeah, that's good to know. I mean, yeah. it is what it is. We it have is to be is. with nature. That's right. I'm over here in Cali, and uh, I'm uh, running around up and down the state. Uh, and uh, you know, it's it's lovely. Spring is beginning here, um, Flowers are and blooming. we have just had the. Um, spring issue is hitting the streets. It's literally coming out this week, which is exciting. Yes. Um, and it's gonna, it's, uh, it's, it's an exciting, uh, issue. It's a really, really special issue because it has Alex and Allison Gray's Mm -hmm. beautiful artwork on the cover. And we also have, uh, David Bronner, um, from Dr. Bronner's Soaps and also from Brother David's. Uh, featured, and so I'm super excited to begin sharing that with everybody. Um, that was a big issue, and uh, and, and now it's out and, and ready to, to hit the streets. It's great when you can grab it by the covers and go look at, you know, it's all that work, all that hard work uh, you achieved, you got that in the hand, and uh, now it's time, you know, you celebrate and move on to the next one. Exactly. <laughs> and here we begin again. So yeah, this week we began work on summer and uh you know we're right in the thick of it already. Uh was you know on with the designer uh, discussing and I won't announce yet uh, who's going to be on the cover uh for that. I'll wait, wait. till um next show. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we're actually I'll, I'll announce it. It's really special. It's it's Supernova Women is going to be on the cover for summer, and Very nice. uh, Supernova is really making waves um, in the the industry. Um, Amber Center uh, is one of the co-founders, and we featured her at the magazine before. Um, and she she learned to grow from skunk long ago. And now she is, you know, an incredible, uh, inspiring entrepreneur. 
And um, we're very proud. I'm very proud that I'm going to be representing black and Latina women on the cover uh, for the summer issue. Um, and we want to see more, more women growers and more uh, female breeders and, and female entrepreneurs uh, to come into the industry. Mm. Um, and, you know, I heard, I read a horrible statistic, Al, that only um, 8% of women CEOs in the cannabis industry, only 8% of CEOs are women oh. in the cannabis industry. Of that's all women. extremely low. Wow, that's, that's brutal. 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 That's not right. So I'm very proud uh, that I'm, that I'm going to be featuring these women for the next issue. And certainly I'm, I'm very proud of the, the woman that I uh, have on tonight uh, speaking of inspiring female entrepreneurs uh, is, is Mary Jane Oatman, uh, who we're going to be welcoming on uh, tonight, Al. And she's a very special lady as well, you know, because we both have this connection with uh, the Tyandaga Mohawk Nation yeah. and Legacy 420 Correct. and the Native Voice. And so I'm, I'm really proud and, and, and to bring on Mary Jane Oatman tonight. Um Al. Uh, I, well, I read the information for the post when I put it up there, and I read it again tonight, and uh, quite the accomplishments, and uh, I look forward to the conversation. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, so without further ado, let's welcome Mary Jane on. Uh, Mary Jane is the owner of THC Magazine, um, and she is an incredibly inspiring individual in the, in the community. Um, she is a member of the Nez Perce tribe and a descendant of the Delaware tribe and proud mother of three beautiful people. Um, she is the founder of the Indigenous Cannabis Coalition and, as I said, publisher of THC Magazine uh, and host of the THC Smoke Singles podcast. Um, and there's many other exciting things that are happening uh, with Mary Jane's work right now. So, but without further ado, Mary Jane, welcome onto the show tonight. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much for having me, Alan, Julie. This is just an amazing opportunity to share the work of THC Magazine and to just elevate the love that I have personally for our sister plant and the many um, positive ways that she has impacted my own personal life. Well, welcome to the, to the broadcast, Mary Jane. We really appreciate you coming on and talking to Julie and I and, and uh, having our listeners uh, hear everything about THC Magazine, your podcast, and, and all the work that uh, you're doing there. Well, thank you. I, uh, I've just uh, celebrated one year anniversary of THC Magazine. Uh, I've had, you know, an incredible year. I've had a lot of people ask me, you know, would you do it all over again, knowing that you were getting ready to start up a print publication in the midst of a pandemic? And I would say, heck yes, I would. <laughs> 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 did, you, did you want to let everybody know what uh, THC stands for when it comes to the magazine? Yes, THC magazine is for tribal hemp and cannabis. It's the nation's first print publication that's dedicated to all of the amazing things that our indigenous communities are doing in hemp and cannabis. Awesome, awesome. Good. And this is so, so, so important, and we're going to dig into mm. why this is so important. Um, but I wanted to, to start first, Mary Jane. I love to start the show with just talking to people about how their journey with cannabis and hemp began and and why uh, and what first, you know, called you to the plant and, and to this work. Uh, so could you tell us a little bit about your story uh, in the beginnings of, of, of how it all started for you with cannabis? Well, thank you, Julie. Again, it's an honor to share uh, this story. I was recently asked, "When was your first time that you ever uh, that you ever consumed cannabis?" And I was just really reflecting upon that question and getting ready to answer it. And then I realized the conversation that I had had on many occasions with my own mom, as we talk about the lack of data and research that's out there, you know, for um, the many aspects of cannabis healing, wellness, and, um, you know, many of our families, uh, including possibly many of the listeners out there, we have 
you know, many uh, generations of qualitative data about how cannabis has impacted our life, you know, where we lack a lot of the quantitative data. And for me, my first time having ever really, I guess you could say, consumed cannabis was in utero. Uh, my mother has been a cannabis user. She used during um, the pregnancies of all six of her very happy, healthy, robust, contributing member of society children. And so, you know, it really made me take a step back and look at, you know, how that interaction has come into play growing up in a household where cannabis was widely accepted, not just in my own household, but many tribal households across our community, and about how we endured, you know, the, the war on drugs in terms of the Reagan era and the, um, the attack that it had on families and school systems. And that's where I remember probably the most vibrant is, um, you know, it was part of our family life, our family system. I remember um, from being a very young age, seeing, uh, you know, a lot of my uncles and my grandpas and, and cousins, you know, at a ceremony like a funeral in a large circle together sharing smoke. And so I've always seen it in a very communal way being shared uh, within family and community. And then it wasn't until um, I was elementary school age in the public schools here on the reservation that my parents first had to have that conversation with us as kids about um, the, the D.A.R.E. campaign and the types of questions that they could possibly ask us and what the repercussions of what some of those questions would be. And in, in that time and, and during the 80s, a lot of times that meant removal of children from home. And so we were just scared to death as little kids Absolutely. to let the cat out of the bag. <laughs> Yeah, about, about no, our parents being users of, of cannabis. So that's some of my earliest memories. And then, you know, from there, I, I just, it's always been a part of my life. Um, you know, with, I watched, you know, uh, one of my, well, only one of my grandfathers actually was a, a medicinal and spiritual user of cannabis. Um, but I started using, um, I guess you could say medicinally while I was in high school. And it was my dad who was the first person that really had introduced it uh, to me um, as an alternative to, um, I was suffering with really bad anxiety. A lot of it was from the high, uh, I guess you could say the, the high caliber of athletics. You know, I was I participated in basketball. And when I got <laughs> recruited up to the varsity basketball team, I started dealing with some really intense anxiety and uh, I was like throwing up before every game and like just dry heaving, you know, and before a basketball game. And I was a freshman on the varsity basketball team, just not really um, coping with the stress very well. That lasted all season long. It wasn't until my sophomore year in high school on the way to one of my basketball games that my dad was, you know, partaking in some smoke and I had gotten enough uh, secondhand smoke to where it really leveled me off before my game that day. And my dad kind of just drew that parallel. And so he had encouraged it. And so from there, it was just, I was a closet smoker as an athlete in high school. Yeah, and that's such an important thing. Um, you know, I experienced it too when I was 16 and I was a dancer six days a week. I had that, that amazing healing quality um, that cannabis can bring to to athletics or just physical activity. And also, uh, also improvement in performance that a lot of athletes experience, and it's still so stigmatized. So it's interesting that that was uh, what led you in. That's beautiful. Um, and and so can we can we go back to uh, now history and helping you know people who are listening in who may not know or may not understand the history and tradition of hemp in uh, on this, this native land that we call now the United States of America, but it was native land first and the practices of husbandry and the practices of, uh, you know, stewardship and working with the different plant allies and working with the different plant medicines, as you said, um, you know, as, as a young person, you were taught in the ways of the plants. And I'm an herbalist, so I, I have such a kinship with you uh, in that regard of how important it is from a young age to teach our children about the plants 
and to understand uh, the relationship of, of ourselves with the plants. So can you take us back a little bit into your knowledge and what you uh, would like to share with others about what were the native traditions that you learned or understood that have probably been, it's been hidden from, from you know, mainstream knowledge or understanding? Yes. So as you mentioned uh, during the intro, I'm a member of the Nez Perce tribe. So the, the Nimipu people or the, um, you know, Tuknitpolu, you know, we had many names prior to European contact, but you know, I can definitely speak upon our people's, you know, robust documented history as cordage and hemp rope making people, as well as, you know, how that, that intersect of the sacred smoke tied into, you know, the signing of the Treaty of 1855, uh, the treaty with the Nestor's Indians and the United States government, uh, you know, where even then it was well, um, I guess you could say it was, it was documented during the, the negotiation of that of that, you know, contract between the government and um, our people's presence as smoking people. It almost grew to the point of annoyance for the negotiators of those treaties. But one thing that was also really critical as they, uh, as they negotiated in that treaty council, you know, over the course of two weeks uh, in the Wallawa Council, or Walla Walla Council, excuse me, is that they, um, the treaty chiefs uh, were also very mindful to talk about um, about the women and that they, you know, were going to go home after they'd had this discussion, go over the terms of the uh, of the treaty negotiations with their wives. And I think that them bringing the role and voice of the women into into that place, uh, you know, was was really critical. Um, and for us, our women were uh, the hemp rope making economy that was still even uh, documented. Um, during the Hudson Bay uh, and the British Fur Trade Journal uh, document. And so when I think about, you know, the, the history that was, you know, documented or archived, you know, from the, you know, the millions of, of sources that are out there that talk about, you know, indigenous people, I can only speak specifically to my people. It is very controversial, sadly, you know, because of how, our our nations were colonized and because of the gaps in history from 1492 clear up to 1855 you know when the treaty was negotiated with the Nez Perce people that there's um there's you know like I mentioned a lot uh excuse me a lot um a lot lost in that uh, in that time frame and shuffle as well as uh the oral histories but that's what we also utilize is, um, you know, in the reclamation and rematriation of our plant histories is our rich oral history. And for, our, for the Nez Perce people, you know, we, we have, um, you know, we have knowledge of our trade routes and our trade systems, but we also have the oral history of our people acquiring, you know, the smoking seed variety, you know, not through the land bridge theory, but through the, you know, the, the great floods. Um, and so, you know, our people, um, you know, amongst the, you know, the Columbia Plateau have had, have had both the rope economy as well as the sacred peace pipe smoking society, you know, since time immemorial. And so today, you know, in, you know, in the, in the 21st century, we find ourselves even trying to, um, I guess you could say, justify that even amongst some of our own sister tribes and sister peers who want to see um, the, the cultural and ethnographic uh, prehistory of our people still through a lens that they want proof, they want documentation, uh, even of oral histories. And so, it is it is tough uh, at times to um, to to work within the context of you know indigenous cannabis uh, her stories because uh, it still it feels like there is a very uh, colonized uh, conversation. Uh, where people want proof of something, and you know, there there's definitely world history proof of the presence of both, you know, the smoking plant as well as you know the the different varieties for making rope and different types of cordage. And so I I just think it, it's strange that people would push back against any of those theories that our people would have gotten it through, you know, trade routes or any other any other methods. 
you know, prior to uh, European contact here on these lands, um, even in our own communities, because, uh, you know, we're very ingenuitive people and a lot of, um, you know, history and connection uh, to to so many different plant medicines. So I don't see why uh, the cannabis plant would be any different. No, absolutely. And that is so fascinating. I have studied a bit because I was in Quebec for five years and looked into the Hudson Bay and have looked into some of the, the histories, but that's one area that I, it would be so wonderful. And I'd love to collaborate with you in some way in the future to, to, to tell that story because uh, we have to, as you said, there's this reclamation and this rematriation that is going on. And it often isn't, you know, necessarily talked about that we tend to go deep on this show of, you know, that the cannabis plant and uh, the, the hemp plant uh, were, you know, a feminine energy that is here to help us heal not just uh, our bodies, but our societies. And so we have to tell the stories and we have to have a reckoning um, and a, a reclaiming uh, of the people, reclaiming their power uh, within and through this, this plant, uh, not uh, being left out of, of, of the history and not being left out of, of the traditions. And that's why the work you're doing is, is so important. Um, so, so thank you for taking us into, into that history with the Nez Perce people specifically. Um, I'd like to go, you know, from there into, you know, as you developed and you were using the plant medicinally, you know, how did it come to, to pass that you felt, you know, that, that you really needed to go further and, and you needed to, to do this work within your community? What was the, what was the impetus and, and, and what basically birthed the THC magazine? I know it's only been a year, but can you tell us now, you know, from that time of medicinal use, how did plant medicine and plant spirits start to work with you and work in your life and, and, and to, to come to, to where we are now? Can you tell us the next leg of your, your story? Yes. After I had my, uh, you know, my healing with uh, being able to uh, overcome, you know, the stress and anxiety of high school and finding uh, finding ways to to cope through the the athletic portion of that with uh, with cannabis, I you know I I really just was kind of a little I guess you could say a little bit more um, of an intermittent user. Um, it called to me during certain seasons is what I noticed that I didn't necessarily um, I didn't I didn't smoke that much during the summertime and in the fall time. Um, you know, when it was time for the family to do harvest, it was the more that I interacted with uh, with trimming and helping dry and getting everything all ready for, for curing for our family's plants um, that I noticed that during the, during the, um, the fall and um, winter time that that was kind of my season of smoke, if you will. And um, then I, I found myself... Um, in that same predicament that my sister found herself in at 23 years old, I was pregnant for my first time. And um, I had witnessed my sister go through uh, some horrible things, you know, with uh, the uh, welfare system here in Idaho. Uh, when she went to go and have her first daughter at the hospital, she tested positive for THC. And they called in, you know, all of the social workers and they wanted to take her baby from her. And so, I found myself struggling during my first pregnancy whether or not I should just completely quit smoking or if I should, you know, continue to use and figure out how I was going to navigate the health system, you know, post, uh, post-labor. And, uh, and so early on in my first trimester, um, I, I completely quit smoking and I found myself um, not able to nourish myself properly and um, you know, wasn't it? It was it wasn't helping my pregnancy. Um, so I did that for about a month, and then I started smoking again very lightly, and you know, and, and very much in moderation. Uh, but 
I did, I did um, only quit out of fear that, you know, that I was going to be dealing with the, uh, the, I guess you could say the system, not so much because I felt like it was doing any harm to my child. I had watched my mother. I've watched many, many people, uh, friends and family, um, you know, go through very healthy pregnancies, uh, you know, with cannabis use. Um, and so that was something that I struggled with really early on. And then I, you know, I overcame that. Um, you know, with just, uh, you know, on the last end of my pregnancy, just really cutting down uh, my use. And I don't know, I, I don't know, honestly, if I was even tested the same way that my sister was, because I didn't have that same issue. I I, I know that I anticipated and I feared it. Um, but, you know, from there, it was just always just kind of moderate and seasonal use. And there would be times when I would just, you know, I would, um, I would find myself uh, just, just um, called to certain strains during specific times of the season. And it's just kind of been like that for my, my whole adult life where I just, um, you know, the medicine calls to me um, during certain, certain times and, and, you know, during certain uh, instances, instances or, you know, traumatic times, which we've had a lot of, I noticed that, you know, that she calls to me a lot more. <laughs> Right. I know because she helps us with the homeostasis. She helps us to thrive. Um, And I just was thinking when you were speaking, you know, that as you said, you had watched through generations, you know, proper use and seeing children thrive, seeing mothers thrive. And, And now we know the science is catching up with us and we know that you know cannabinoids are present in mother's breast milk um that these are the the building blocks of life actually and and this is why uh you know um we we can now prove these things and 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 these these horrible uh actions um that have been taken against families um, can stop, you know, and then obviously that's our devotion and that's our work. Um, but <laughs> yeah, oh, don't get me wrong. I was not always, I was not always on this, you know, on the, on the, on the pro cannabis train. There was a time period between the ages of probably, uh, I would say nine and 13 where my parents and I went through a really, really rough time because I, I couldn't have sleepovers. I was embarrassed of my family life. I would, you know, try to go places and I would tell them, don't smoke that stinky stuff into the house because I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to go to my recital smelling like weed and things like that, you know. So, you know, when I was in that time period of my life, I was very much anti because it felt like I was hiding something and I wanted to have a regular teenager life or a regular young adult life. And one day my parents just finally pulled me aside and they were telling me, well, so-and-so's parents smoke weed and, you know, well, don't feel so bad because, you know, those parents do this and this and that. And so it was really um, where I realized that what um, what was happening there behind closed doors with many cannabis families was more mainstream. And that's kind of why I wanted to do THC magazine is, um, is we need more mainstreaming of the spiritual pathways in our own sovereignty and healing and choices in our tribal communities. And I felt like, you know, with a name like Mary Jane, I just have to. I just have to. (laughs) (laughs) It's a popular name. (laughs) It absolutely is. (laughs) (laughs) Actually, you felt encouraged. Go ahead, sorry. We have a voice of a Mary Jane that's uh, played before and after each of our broadcasts. There's a Mary Jane that does our disclaimer, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. They're, they're everywhere. So. You just never know. It's actually uh, break time. What do you think? Jump in there now. Absolutely, I just realized, and I, I was so enthralled with uh, <laughs> with Mary Jane and going to the next question that I didn't even realize it was already five thirty. So, <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah, it's that time, time to pay some bills. Uh, but first, uh, our uh, our listeners during this commercial break, our listeners are going to hear about our contest we got going here on the network. Uh, that's with Colexia uh, new, um, Essential Nutrients. Uh, they're giving away some free samples of their food. And I'd like to congratulate Alicia. Uh, she's last week's winner. So we look forward to see who wins next week. We'll announce it during next week's broadcast. 
So other than that, uh, that information we heard during the, each of our commercial breaks. And from there, Julie and I will be right back after our, with our guest, Mary Jane Oatman. Uh, you're listening to the Pace Radio Show. We are live here at paceradio.net. You're listening to the Pace Radio Network here at paceradio.net. At Legacy 420, we believe in being different. Experience the difference of quality control. Our labs provide tested formulations for all of our products. Experience the difference in trust. Our customers can trust that we are following up-to-date COVID precautions for their safety. Experience the difference in accessibility. We're open seven days a week. Please visit our website, Legacy420.com, or contact us for curbside pickup as well as nationwide mail order shipping. Legacy 420 values overall wellness. Come and experience the difference of Legacy 420. The People's Alliance of Cannabis in Canada is an organization working to improve cannabis legalization in Canada. They have a mission and values that includes all Canadians, no matter where they come from. The values are including everyone, as no one should be excluded from participating, equality, diversity, advocacy, along with cannabis education and research, plus industry safety and professional standards if this is an organization that has the same values as you check them out at people's alliance of cannabis in canada.ca once again people's alliance of cannabis in canada.ca check them out enjoy the buzz of legalization with campbellford lifestyle shop from lights to plant nutrients books consumption accessories and more we've got all your basics to grow or consume cannabis Visit our info center or take a look at our piercing services and body jewelry. Now available in store through Campbellford Lifestyle Shop. 17 Bridge Street West, Campbellford. What do you find at paceradio.net? People advocating cannabis education. A doctor's job is to relieve your pains. And when it comes to growing cannabis, the biggest pain is trimming. Let Dr. Buck Cannabis Trimming Solutions take the pain away. Whether you're a home grower or a commercial operation, we have the cure. From four plants to 400 plants, garden size doesn't matter. Dr. Buck Cannabis Trimming Solutions comes to you with years of experience and professional discreet service. It's simple. We trim your weed and we do a damn good job. Visit drbuckcts.com to book your or trimming. Hey growers and grow shops, do you want a 20% increase in yield from your cannabis grow? Then you need Collexin Nutrients for bigger, better buds. Grow Micro Bloom is a three-part premium-based nutrient trio specifically formulated to give you bigger, better buds. Win your own sample kit by heading to collexinutrients.com and contact us with your name, email, and catchphrase. We will pick one random name on the Pace Radio Facebook page. So remember, check out Collexa Essential Nutrients for bigger, better buds at collexinutrients.com. CTCP operates a medicinal cannabis signing clinic. If you want to grow your own medicinal cannabis and are located anywhere in Canada, then I'd like to suggest that you give them a call. They can be reached at 1-613-967-9888. That's one 967 9888 and grow on with CTCP. Growing your own vegetables, flowers, or even medicinal plants can be a challenge without the right equipment and proper know-how. At BMA Hydroponics, not only are they your urban horticultural experts and suppliers, but their staff holds the customer's needs paramount to making a sale. Family-owned with decades of experience and knowledge, they offer free advice in person by phone or email. BMA Hydroponics wants to ensure you have the advice you need, which is why you'll find tips and tricks on different ways to grow, like wick, ebb and flow, drip, or aeroponic system, as well as other helpful links at bmahydroponics.com. If you can't find what you're looking for, just let them know, and they'll do everything they can to get what you're looking for. At BMA Hydroponics, each staff member also possesses a federal exempt MMAR license, making their strong suit, empathy, experience, and dedication to their customers. Because when you know how to grow, you'll have results that make you proud. BMA Hydroponics in Belleville, Ontario. Visit bmahydroponics.com. We are people advocating cannabis education here at paceradio.net. Hello and welcome back. You're listening to the Pace Radio Show and we are live here at paceradio.net. Tonight in the program we're joined by our guest, Mary Jane Oatman, the founder of Indigenous Cannabis Coalition and the host of the THC Smoke Signals Podcast and the publisher of THC Magazine, plus my joint host, skunk owner, co-owner, Julie Corallo. Well, ladies, that's a lot of breath in there. 
lot of lot of work, know, a lot of work going it's on. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> when I first met Mary Jane, I was so thrilled, you know, to meet another female publisher uh, and a female, you know, magazine person. Uh, that and we, you know, our first talks, Mary Jane, were so uh, just inspiring and uplifting because we were very much, you know, kindred spirits of just, uh, you know, women that were uh, working our butts off to to do what was right, to do what the plant uh, medicine was calling us to do uh, mm-hmm. in business. And so uh, that's what you were getting to before we went to the break was, you know, uh, this movement of people coming out more and it becoming more popular, more talked about. And, and, and this is what you were saying was inspiring Hey, you know, we we need a publication. We need a publication that's covering the native stories. So can you speak to that a bit more and I I want to get deeper into that subject as we go as well. Yes, in 2017 and 18, I served on the Minority Cannabis Business Association Board of Directors. They are an amazing organization. They're doing some really great things you know, headed up by some phenomenal people, their founders and visionaries, you know, even the ones that are no longer associated with the organization. They're all just people that I look up to and and admire in the cannabis industry and space. But even with them, very, you know, knowledgeable, educated people in the cannabis industry, it was, you know, Treaties 101 and, you know, talking about tribes, treaty rights, you know, how they're impacted with cannabis legalization, how they can be negatively impacted. It felt like that conversation, you know, even at at that level was either being missed or not necessarily, you know, people was like, oh, okay, well, that's, that's, uh, you know, a a bummer. And, you know, then on to the the fast and fancy conversation, you know, about making all the zeros and open up multi-state operations. And I realized during that same time period that tribes were still dealing with, you know, the negative impacts of being left out of the um, 2014 farm bill. Tribes in California were still getting raided for hemp farms, while other, you know, companies across the nation were expanding the multi-state operations. And so I thought something here just isn't right. And so I mean, I think there was, yeah. And there were still, you know, a, a couple of other organizations out there at the time, and there are that were working in in this space. But for me, um, I felt like, and, and this is just from my past experience of working in Indian country nonprofits, is that, you know, there's the coalition building of tribal cannabis organizations that needs to happen. Sometimes and, and very often just in organizational structures, people kind of just work in silos. And I wanted to find a way to be more of a bridge builder between the different entities as well as the other large non-native serving organizations like the, you know, NCIA and, you know, all of the bigs that are out there that are not, I mean, nothing about their policy um, advancement, anything about their, their state agendas or their national agendas are about protection or preservation of indigenous rights in the legalization of cannabis. And so it felt like, you know, there's a a bigger mission that needs to be had. So I actually started the Indigenous Cannabis Coalition first. And the Indigenous Cannabis Coalition is who publishes THC Magazine and who will be launching the Smoke Signals podcast to create the education and advocacy, you know, about the innovative things that tribes are doing in this space, as well as talking about the business opportunities for uh, for nonprofits and for small companies uh, to do business in Indian country. Wow. I want to go back to that point of, you know, here we are with the Farm Bill, which, you know, inspired so many uh, that we could be closer, we could be inching our way closer towards the end to cannabis prohibition and federal legalization. But you just illustrated so perfectly how what's happening incrementally is the white, wealthy, oftentimes male uh, counterpart is a wide open door and pathway is being made. Of course, we're still all dealing with prohibition, so it's not that. But 
there's been so many inroads made uh, and and so much business happening within that sphere. And like you said, those same kinds of uh, things aren't happening. In fact, they're being, you know, natives are being completely left out. Uh, the tribal lands completely left out. And this is a fact that people listening in may not know uh, that this is this is what's happening. Um, and so, you know, this is this is so so important that we have representation uh, of Native people, of Black people, of Latino people. I myself am a Latina uh, businesswoman, uh, and so I'm also within the, those groupings. But we, we see that we have to create these bridges also for the Asian community so that we are not dealing with what we're seeing still overwhelmingly, it, which is this whitewashing of the cannabis industry and uh, the domination uh, of, of the white male, you know, over the whole entire, uh, you know, power and control. Of, of the industry and the movement of the industry. And that's, that's why I think we're so important, women like us, that are running um, our, our businesses in the way that we are. Um, so can you speak to that uh, a, a bit more? Yes, I, um, you know, I, I've been thinking about the, the direction of, uh, you know, where we, where we could and should be going, you know, for our different tribal communities and, uh, there's so much land tenure, you know, still within uh, tribal ownership across the nation, as well as the different water rights in those spaces. And I'm, you know, that's where I was realizing and recognizing before I'd even started the, the publication for Tribal Hemp and Cannabis Magazine is that a, a lot of the different uh, communities had already started moving in that direction. And, and yet other folks didn't know about what they were doing in that space or how things were, uh, you know, so... For me, it's just it's just been about trying to find a way to um, to I guess there's just no media out there for different for tribal communities, and that's what's been so frustrating. Even watching during the Senate confirmation hearing of Deb Hallen, is that you know tribes have not been uh, have you know the the voice of what tribal communities are doing is not very um, very vocal even though what we're doing is very impactful and very pivotal, uh, you know, for, uh, I guess you could say, a, a, a just transition for, you know, the, the climate initiative. And a lot of that is happening, you know, in ground zeroes on tribal communities. We're just not seeing that, though, um, because there's no media focus on, on any of those initiatives. But what I was finding is that tribes were doing some, you know, very big things in cannabis. It was just little tiny pings. You weren't really hearing about it. And so for me and the preservation of story in this space, it became really critical and because as an, I, I was an adult language learner also. I did not, I wasn't raised around the Nez Perce language. I actually got a minor in it while I was in college. And as I was going through that whole practice of learning my, my native language, um, I was always grateful to, you know, the anthropologists and the, the linguists, and most of them were non-native people. But they had came to our community and they had, you know, created dictionaries, created archives, created ways for me to be able to to make that connection and pass to my ancestors, to my people, you know, where that was lost or broken. And that's kind of where I see what we're doing now during this time frame is uh, we're living in a very, very historic time. And as future um, ancestors, I guess, if you will, I want our our unborn generations to know, you know, what the work that was done, the um, the spirit that was behind it, and so that's why it was really important for me to just work towards the preservation of a print publication, um, to do the legwork to make sure that every issue was archived in the Library of Congress because, you know, it's just a very quick blink of an eye that we're here to do this work, but it is, um, it's 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 going to be looked upon, you know, 500 years down the road, a thousand years down the road, you know, people are going to, people are going to be looking at what happened, what, what we're doing right now. That's right. Exactly. That, yeah. I, yeah. And it's, you speak to my 
my heart so much with that. And you know, my whole devotion has been with, with skunk is to use it as a vehicle to speak about the renaissance that is happening on the planet, uh, which we are in agreement on. Um, and that we, we, you're right, we're living in extremely historical times <laughs> that we will look back on, I believe, uh, to talk about that the, this was the new renaissance or that this was the green renaissance or, um, you know, in the Hopi traditions, uh, in other traditions, Lakota traditions, uh, they spoke of the white buffalo calf, um, uh, you know, uh, and, and different prophecies and different stories that have been told of a time when we would be remembering who we are as stewards and that we were, you know, human beings' rightful place is through stewardship, is through husbandry, that this is what brings us great joy and and happiness as human beings when we foster and and maintain that that earth connection and that connection you know with our seasons with our plants so um <clears throat> i'm so thankful you know that you heeded the call and said we need to we need to chronicle this um so so going going further it seems like in your work, you know, you really are are dealing with multiple fronts <laughs> that you're working <laughs> to create change, uh, and so you're you're having to work with the stigma and the shame uh, and just the epigenetic, the pain that's going through the generations within the native community. So that's one front. All right, and then to, to as you said, to to tell the histories and to tell the stories that are coming through, um, and and to highlight the communities that are making progress. Um, so you're, and and then to just also change the nature of how you know natives are are viewed and their capabilities um within this community we have to demand our rights like you said water rights we we can't the natives have not even been able to to have the the proper water rights that they deserve and should have uh, so i'm in a quandary myself and i just want to help it's part of why you and i are talking about how we can get together and put more visibility on native voices and native stories. Yes, I, you know, that's why I appreciate being able to have the the network of folks that I do, and I've just been so grateful and so blessed to enter into this uh, world of cannabis print publication because it has been very welcoming from, you know, I think it was after the second issue, I just really worked on distribution as, as widely as I could. And uh, the publisher of Marijuana Ventures, Greg James, picked up my magazine and gave me a call and just said, you know, congratulations, it's a beautiful publication, and I just wanted to just check in and see how things were, you know. And this was when, like, we were in, you know, stage one across the nation. I mean, this is like, you know, April, May of last year, and things were just kind of, like, funky, and then into the summertime, uh, threaded me into a cannabis publisher's network. And so if, if it wouldn't have been for the peer support more than anything during that time, I had a lot of, you know, second guessing and questioning going on. And that put some wind in my sail most definitely. And then things kind of started getting a little bit funky again. And, you know, just um, people, I mean, cannabis was essential at this point, you know, in the fall of last year. And I'm hearing, well, we're not really, you know, focusing on print ads right now. And, you know, we're essential. We don't even need to advertise. And so then I got another dip in trying to support the uh, cost of publishing and distributing the magazine uh, mm. because people weren't buying cannabis ads all over again. And so then I was like, oh, good God, what am I going to do? And, um, you know, just a lot of prayer and, you know, a lot of answered prayer. I, uh, I just... I, that's all I can say is I, I know how important that relationships are and that we've got a lot of, uh, you know, definitely got a lot of work uh, ahead of us, you know, even within our own, uh, still within our own, uh, you know, family systems and communities. 
we're not asking everybody to, you know, pick up a bong and start smoking. That's not, when we talk about legalization of marijuana, what we're saying is that we want people to be liberated to have their own choice in how they feel. Because as I said earlier, you know, the medicine doesn't call to everybody. And I think that yeah. a big part of that as well is that people know that it's not just picking up a bong or a duty anymore. There's transdermal patches, there's, you know, subdermal ways, there's uh, transdermal ways of ingestion, you know, and then I don't, I don't know, you know, a grandma out there that would not like to just, you know, sip on a, a you know, some CBD wine. And yet many of our elders don't know that there's option in consumption. And so that's another big part of doing this work is that we have, um, that we have, um, we have some big barriers to, to take down <laughs> in education. Yeah, yeah, it's absolutely. And <clears throat> I know my grandmother, who's 93, uh, she calls the cannabis cream her miracle cream. <clears throat> but, you know, it's been a process over 15 years, 20 years of her changing um, over time and and understanding the science and trying it out. Um, and you're exactly right. It's not just about the recreational side. Uh, it's about the industry, uh, that it, the, the ability that it has, uh, just going back to Ned's first, you know, origins with the, the hemp cordage, uh, of the ability that hemp has and cannabis has to transform other industries and to power um, communities and to provide abundance and, 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 you know, the components for communities to thrive. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about that and, and anything that you could update us on within the Native communities and, and, and what you have seen or, you know, any inspiring stories um, or developments that have been occurring that you'd like to share uh, on that side within the, the Native communities with hemp and cannabis in particular you know, there's, there is just so much. That's what's been such a blessing about doing this work and the preservation of these stories and just reaching out and working with the different tribal communities is, you know, learning about um, Blue Keith Keith, the owner of uh, Think It Technology, you know, out of uh, Southern California. He's a, a member of the EPI Nation, and he's working on some amazing innovative solutions in packaging is, uh, you know, for tribes to have a vision of nation-to-nation -nation trade and what would compliance and regulations look like if a tribe from California wanted to supply medicine and products to a tribe from New York, for instance, you know? So what would that, what would that um, you know, everybody talks about, you know, seed-to-sale tracking systems, and he was thinking a lot more robust, you know, clear to the very end buyer as well as the end packaging system so that um, you would be able to actually tell if, pack, you know, packaging was being recycled properly, incentivize uh, consumers on the back end um, with, uh, you know, rewards programs for proper disposals of their packaging systems, as well as, you know, if somebody endured a recall, you know, for a product, about how you would actually contact um contact uh, consumers to, to alert them of recall. Just some, you know, really neat things that were on the crux of the gaming industry. And so, I mean, that's just like a non-plant touching, you know, amazing innovation that's going on in tribal communities. Um, there's there's just really some, some great things going on. On the retail side, we have the Walker River tribe um, in Nevada getting ready to open up their very first dispensary uh, right around the corner, like they're stacking it as we speak. Um, the Bay Mills Indian community is one to be on the watch for up there in Michigan. They opened up their first dispensary, Northern Light Cannabis Company, and they are getting ready to uh, start their own uh, farm operation. They're going to have their own processing facilities. Nice. They want to start on, uh, you know, school curriculum. Um, and so that's what I really am excited to see is that the tribes that are working in this space 
definitely want to provide education to the communities. They want it to be a part of their tribal college systems, uh, you know, from, you know, business certification for running dispensaries, you know, plant touching opportunities, as well as the science and technology mm. piece of it, because we want our young people seeing themselves working, you know, in the artificial intelligence as well as the tech side of cannabis. And, um, you know, there's, I'm here in Idaho, and our tribe wants to start growing, and we've been approved as of February 12th for our hemp plan, but there's going to be nowhere to test cannabis here in Idaho unless one of the tribes does it, you know? So I'm really excited for the opportunities for all of the tribes, especially in fiber, because of how much land capacity that we have and because of how many super fun sites that we have on and near reservations where, you know, phytoremediation um, is going to be huge in some of these land cleanup projects. And so, um, you know, while I, you know, I'm excited about seeing some of the most delicious tasting, you know, flour coming out of tribal communities that's like, that puts the most top shelf of any so-called top shelf cannabis, you know, on its knees. That's what's mm-hmm. happening in tribal communities. With some of these cultivators, 45th parallel out of Oregon, oh my goodness, they just blow it out of the water every time. So, you know, there's tr- individual individual entrepreneurs, I think, is what's really gotten on my radar lately. Is I've been so focused on what tribal communities are doing, what tribal governments are doing, but the entrepreneurs, the individual tribal members in urban and reservation communities across the country, they are doing some pretty fire things. Right, and I love what you just said in terms of, oh my gosh, what a a beautiful, poetic, dramatic, painful irony, but nonetheless Mm -hmm. important, is to to take that land and, you know, that they, that, that natives were so shamefully pushed towards with these reservations, as they called them, to to take it and turn it into, you know, to transmute that lead to gold. And as you stated, they've done it with the 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 casinos, but it's so beautiful to see cannabis and hemp enter enter the stage. And to see that, as you said, to do high volume hemp fiber um on to to find ways for that repurposed reuse of the land um that's just lying fallow fallow um would would be repurposed to to create opportunity and this contrast to to where you know a seventeen year old native girl uh may say no there's great opportunity within cannabis not be shame you know ashamed or afraid uh you know or or to be a young mom and afraid that that cps is going to come versus oh you know she she's a part of uh, you know this incredible hemp fiber uh company or she's doing her her edible line uh, throughout uh, her entire network and out into uh, the regular, uh, you know, space as well. Uh, and so just to see those inroads made, you know, and to see, you know, more and more millions of more opportunities um, made um, for healing and empowerment. Oh, most so definitely. There's, yeah. I'd love to cover that. That uh, that's a perfect thing too, in terms of you know spotlighting these success stories. Um, and I've been talking a lot with um, you know black members of our community as well, and 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 turning the pain around. You know, turning the pain to gold uh, of 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 making it beautiful by by getting people's hands in the soil, getting people's. Um, you know, uh, minds and, 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 and their daily lives more integrated back with cultivation and uh, earth consciousness. So what do you think, you know, I know that you, you've just been um, nominated or just took a position 
can you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, and I know we may have to go to a break, and so if we pause, uh, I want to to hear more about what you're doing with that and, and how you feel, you know, what do you feel are the key areas um, that, that people can become more aware, uh, that people can help? Um, so I wanted to give you a chance to speak to those, those things. Shall we go for break first? Okay. Sure. Let's do a break. Let's do the break first. I, I have one, you know, during the last break, we talked about some of those questions that throw people off. Remember that the conversation? <laughs> yes. I, I, I I've got one. You know, this has got nothing to do. Oh, with good, little, good. We, we, we've we've had this. We've had this has got nothing to do with the conversation we've had tonight. But I found it incredible when I when I read in in the information that Julie provided for the post in the show that you love to chip wood. You like to <laughs> you like yeah. to you like to swing a axe and cut wood, eh? Cool, because. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> it's it, it can be it can be a uh, you know it's uh, uh, a lot of people try to avoid that sometimes. <laughs> so yeah, I I grew up uh, always watching my dad chop wood and my brothers were and so I just just because of how the role had always kind of played out in my family when I was probably about thirteen fourteen years old. Mm-hmm. Um, it was more, it turned more of into a challenge, you yeah. know, where I, I, my brother was like, well, you can't chop that block of wood. And, you know, I stepped up to a pretty <laughs> sizable block that one of my other brothers had took a swing at and, and he didn't chop it in half. And I you know, stepped up to it and whacked and just knocked it right in half. And my dad said that, you know, you have a pretty good swing. I think you should come out, you know, come out getting wood with us. <laughs> and, so I, I, wow. I, I, I think that's how they enticed me. And I didn't realize what a hard workout it was until I you know, got out there. But that's just kind of like what we do as a family is, you know, harvesting wood, harvest, mm-hmm. harvesting everything together I all can, the time. I can remember a long, long, long time ago uh, when I was much younger. Uh, I know I enjoyed being out in the woods on the, on the frozen swamps uh, back north, uh, cutting wood for the cabin for the weekend. So, but... Uh, yeah, it it's wonderful to swing that axe and to just put your back yeah. into it. And you, Mary yep. Jane, small but mighty, yeah. watch out! I know you I... are. <laughs> well, you are fierce. Uh, you know, I saw the pictures. You know that you supplied for the post and uh, swinging an axe. Wow. Okay, I'm gonna ask her about that. <laughs> so uh, when you, I thought, hey, this is a good time to throw that offhanded question. You don't expect. But uh, let's, <laughs> let's. That was uh, a great question, actually, because I love I love visualizing Mary Jane. It's perfect to 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 you know illustrate who you are as a Spitfire woman yeah. who says, "Just watch me. I'm going to do this." <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Exactly. Oh, that's right. All right. Let's head over for break time, and uh, we get an opportunity for our listeners to hear from our sponsors. Uh, we'll, we'll return after the break and continue our conversation with our guest, Mary Jane Oatman. You're listening to the Pace Radio Show. We are live here at paceradio.net. You're listening to the Pace Radio Network here at paceradio.net. Growing your own vegetables, flowers, or even medicinal plants can be a challenge without the right equipment and proper know-how. At BMA Hydroponics, not only are they your urban horticultural experts and suppliers, but their staff holds the customer's needs paramount to making a sale. Family-owned with decades of experience and knowledge, they offer free advice in person by phone or email. BMA Hydroponics wants to ensure you have the advice you need, which is why you'll find tips and tricks on different ways to grow, like Wick, Ebb and Flow, Drip, or Aeroponic System, as well as other helpful links at bmahydroponics.com. If you can't find what you're looking for, just let them know, and they'll do everything they can to get what you're looking for. At BMA Hydroponics, each staff member also possesses a federal exempt MMAR license, making their strong suit, empathy, experience, and dedication to their customers. Because when you know how to grow, you'll have results that make you proud. BMA Hydroponics in Belleville, Ontario. Visit bmahydroponics.com. CTCP operates a medicinal cannabis signing clinic. If you want to grow your own medicinal cannabis and are located anywhere in Canada, then I'd like to suggest that you give them a call. They can be reached at 1-613-967-9888. That's one 
9888 and grow on with CTCP. Pace Radio is the People Advocating Cannabis Education Radio Network. A doctor's job is to relieve your pains. And when it comes to growing cannabis, the biggest pain is trimming. Let Dr. Buck Cannabis Trimming Solutions take the pain away. Whether you're a home grower or a commercial operation, we have the cure. From four plants to 400 plants, garden size doesn't matter. Dr. Buck Cannabis Trimming Solutions comes to you with years of experience and professional discreet service. It's simple. We trim your weed and we do a damn good job. Visit drbuckcts.com to book your or trimming. Hey growers and grow shops, do you want a 20% increase in yield from your cannabis grow? Then you need Collexin Nutrients for bigger, better buds. Grow Micro Bloom is a three-part premium-based nutrient trio specifically formulated to give you bigger, better buds. Win your own sample kit by heading to CollexinNutrients.com and contact us with your name, email, and catchphrase. We will pick one random name on the Pace Radio Facebook page. So remember, check out Collexa Essential Nutrients for bigger, better buds at CollexinNutrients.com. Enjoy the buzz of legalization with Campbellford Lifestyle Shop. From lights to plant nutrients, books, consumption accessories, and more, we've got all your basics to grow or consume cannabis. Visit our info center or take a look at our piercing services and body jewelry, now available in-store through Campbellford Lifestyle Shop. 17 Bridge Street West, Campbellford. The People's Alliance of Cannabis in Canada is an organization working to improve cannabis legalization in Canada. They have a mission and values that includes all Canadians, no matter where they come from. The values are including everyone, as no one should be excluded from participating, equality, diversity, advocacy, along with cannabis education and research, plus industry, safety, and professional standards. If this is an organization that has the same values as you, check them out at peoplesallianceofcannabisincanada.ca. Once again, People's Alliance of Cannabis in Canada.ca. Check them out. At Legacy 420, we believe in being different. Experience the difference of quality control. Our labs provide tested formulations for all of our products. Experience the difference in trust. Our customers can trust that we are following up-to-date COVID precautions for their safety. Experience the difference in accessibility. We're open seven days a week. Please visit our website, Legacy420.com, or contact us for curbside pickup as well as nationwide mail order shipping. Legacy 420 values overall wellness. Come and experience the difference of Legacy 420. 420. You're listening to the Pace Radio Network here at paceradio.net. Hello, and we're back. Uh, we are live at paceradio.net, and we are the Pace Radio Show. Tonight, I am joined by a guest, Mary Jane Oatman, the founder of the Indigenous Cannabis Coalition, plus she's also the host of the THC Smoke Signals podcast, plus she is the publisher of THC Magazine. She has got many hats, and she is working to get the word out about everything tribal and cannabis and hemp. And uh, we are joined also by my joint host, Skunk Magazine co-owner, Julie Corallo. Well, ladies, we've had quite the first two segments, and I know Julie has got a wild one planned for the third segment of the broadcast. Yeah, I mean, I just want to give Mary Jane a chance to, to talk more about projects that are coming up, uh, any important work that you're doing. And uh, certainly, I am excited. One of the things that I'm so excited about is that Mary Jane is going to be sharing uh, her writing at Skunk. Um, we are going to awesome. be helping to bring visibility uh, to, to certain articles or certain stories. Um, that are important, that we both feel are important to get more eyes on. Mary Jane and I have formed a partnership uh, in that sense where we're going to be helping each other uh, to hit the vision because we know it's a collective shared vision of one humanity. Uh, but Mary Jane, um, what, can you talk to us a little bit about some of the key things that you're working on and also you know, help people to where people can find you. Um, I, I'm very excited to do more with you. I'd love to hold a clubhouse with you. But can you tell people a little bit more about stuff that you're working on uh, 
coming up and, and then also where to find you? Yes. So the THC Smoke Signals podcast has been an amazing work in progress. I was I was really excited and was hoping uh, to, to have a more ambitious schedule and launch it in late February. And I'd had a, a great lineup of guests and I'd started working on, on a, some pre-production work. And then uh, I just got, um, I got really overwhelmed uh, and just kind of held off on that a little bit because it felt like I was taking on too much because uh, at the same time, I was accepting the position to serve as the ACLU of Idaho affiliate president. And sometimes, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I want to put uh, quality into the work. And so I postponed the launch of THC Smoke Signals podcast so that I can really get my legs underneath me serving as the first tribal uh, person from the state of Idaho to, uh, you know, to lead in that capacity at the ACLU. And we're out here in Idaho, which is sometimes referred to as the south of the Pacific Northwest. And we definitely have a lot of work to do in, um, you know, in building relationships. Sometimes uh, it's a toxic place, you know, to live in as an indigenous woman, as a woman of color. There's just um, there's there's this really sad mindset that still exists within even our own Idaho legislature, who this year put um, put forth uh, one of the senators uh, put forth a constitutional ban on the legalization of marijuana. And I'm like, are you kidding me? And so you know, there's all these things that we're <laughs> how out of time on. could you be, right? <laughs> like, uh, get with the times, man. So this is your work you with know, the ACLU. To keep going. Sorry. Yeah. So, yeah, so there's so there's work within the Idaho legislature, both you know for the Indigenous Cannabis Coalition, you know, as well as the ACLU, uh, and then just uh, with uh, you know a lot of the racial justice issues and agenda items that we are pursuing, you know, nationally with the ACLU as well as uh, as uh, within you know our state affiliates. I see that we have definitely a strengthening of, you know, the American Indian agenda within the ACLU. They have one, but it does not, you know, it, it's not always as meaningful if you don't have the people at the table that are doing the, you know, the continuous education and the advocacy. So I see that this year, um, you know, strengthening and elevating the voice within that agenda is, is definitely going to uh, be some work. And that's why it's been so amazing to network with these other state affiliates and some of the staff members that are, are doing that work uh, on the ground in their, within their respective state where there's a large tribal uh, population. And one of the other areas uh, of work that I'm really excited about is um, you know, when I started the magazine, I knew that print publication was only going to be able to reach so broad of an audience. That's also why THC Smoke Signals, you know, you have the potential and the caliber to reach a global audience with digital media format. But I also know that we have a lot of work to do with the education component. And so I have been writing grants like crazy as well as, uh, you know, speculating for people that want to invest in the development of a, a documentary uh, on the the work that's being done in the fiber tribes, specifically in Indian country. So, um, you know, storyboarding for for a film, I've I've put forth a couple of different proposals to uh, for for grant making opportunities, and uh, I'm just you know looking for dynamic ways to get the to get the project funded because. Um, it takes money to to do that work, and I know that there's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, alignment of the stars that needs to happen. <laughs> but that is so beautiful! Oh my gosh! And we should definitely, uh, you know, again, that's one of the important things is to continue to highlight um, what you're what you're developing um, through our portal. And we talk about, you know, that, this idea of equity. Um, what does equity mean anyways, you know? Um, it's being tossed around a lot, and then it doesn't always pencil out. <laughs> and there's a lot of uh, tokenism. There's a lot of appropriation. Um, uh, there's a lot of just really kind of things that 
frankly, are, are ugly or, or not something that is in alignment. Can we speak to that a bit? Because uh, it isn't all sunshine and rainbows. And, and, and <laughs> right? There's a oh, lot of education okay. oh, that has to happen with that. Oh, goodness, you you couldn't be more spot on. That was actually one of the reasons that I, um, you know, I, I found myself checking out from some of the different social media forums that were that were out there and why I've been really happy to see more of an elevation uh, of that conversation within like somewhere like the clubhouse because when I first entered into into the clubhouse I mean I was just blown away by uh, you know I I am a you know a cultural anthropologist by training and so I had to just kind of check out for a minute and just sit in the room as an observer and not necessarily ever want to participate in the conversation and and it was because I couldn't believe the dynamics of what was happening in some of these rooms with the moderator badges and the the people that started up the rooms getting completely kicked out and some of the chauvinistic and male ego-driven energy that was happening in some of the cannabis space specifically, where they're just talking about, you know, making a lot of money and the green rush and everything seemed so um, fraternity <laughs> within some of those spaces. Right. But I also noticed that that energy was, you know, I, I guess it was maybe just the excitement of the new social, you know, forum or whatnot. And then that just kind of fizzled out. Or maybe I just, I seen that the rooms were just kind of curating themselves. And, um, you know, we just have to be protective of our own, you know, spiritual persons within these uh, spaces. And so, you know, I just kind of quit entering them where I saw that the people that were really perpetuating those energies were, were there, then I just don't be in those different spaces. But what I've really found is that, um, you know, there's there's so much uh, thirst for knowledge and specifically even about um, sense of place. And that's really why I love uh, having the opportunity to share you know, the work and even just my own perspectives is, you know, we're, we're trained and, and taught to think about how you know, different we are when really we have so much more in common. And once we work from that foundation, and um, there's so much more healing. And a good example of that is, you know, in, in Northern California, you know, for the past few decades, tribes have been pitted against the farming community over salmon, over the conversation of is there enough water for salmon? And it's been really amazing to see more of a, a union or a unity um, between tribes and farm farmers over the preservation and protection of water, uh, you know, because of some of the other interests and some of the uh, corporate uh, fossil fuel industries that impact both communities. And so, you know, they lay down their swords and they come together and work, you know, more in harmony and unity. Same thing happened during XL Keystone, uh, there's the Keystone XL pipeline with the, um, the, the Indians and the cowboys. They actually <laughs> created a Cowboys and Indians alliance. You know where they where we have to find where we have more in common, and 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 move forward from there as opposed to you know working, working within our differences because, you know especially when it comes to the Crips and Blood Gang Wars of Congress and all of the shenanigans that are happening in Capitol Hill, <laughs> it's just ludicrous. It's so ludicrous because you know at the end of the day both parties are very negligent for some horrific crimes against humanity. And, you know, equally with blood on their hands. Right. And you pointed that out so eloquently that if if people had not, if the white man hadn't come in and chronicled the Nez Perce language in the way that they did, you wouldn't have been able to benefit. And so you share great wisdom here in the, in the balance between the shadow and the light and that the shadow and the light are always working together to birth new forms within society and that we can't fear it, that we must embrace it and find ways to create those bridges, those moments of union where the two come together, right? Very deep, deep wisdom, Mary Jane. Um, And, and (laughs) it's, it's inspiring. (laughs) 
to me. Yeah. Uh, and, and I'm excited. You know, I'm excited for us to continue um, to do that work together. It's just to weave this better narrative of, of, of building bridges into the future and, you know, creating, uh, fostering stewardship and healing and empowerment for human beings. And, and, and it's one human race. You know, this is a very, very popular theme within the cannabis space because of Bob Marley, you know, this idea of one, one love, one heart, uh, one planet that it, that it wants to come through right now within this change that's taking place. So can you tell us, you know, I want people to be able to find you. Um, I want people to be able to access uh, the current issues. Um, you know, where can they go and purchase? Where can they sign up for a subscription? Um, yes. So for THC Magazine, it was, you know, like when I first started the concept of it, which actually came way back, a variety of it, came back in 2017 while I was working as a legal bud tender in the Washington Recreational Market. I was kind of like, you know, doing some research and, you know, if I ran around the dispensary, I'd want to know what the front end of the operations looked like. So I'm like, I'm going to be a bud tender. And while I was doing that work, I saw some major, and this is when, you know, Washington was just, you know, a, a couple of years off the ground in the recreational retail marketplace. And I saw some big gaps just in advertising. You know, there were very few publications, cannabis trade publications at the time, but the ones that were starting to put out just seemed very advertisement heavy, not a whole lot of story content within them. And and so I thought, well, oh, the first thing that I had a dream about uh, creating a calendar, but as a part of the dream was actually the, the masthead of the magazine, the THC logo, and so when I, uh, you know, fast forward to 2019, I decided um, that I was going to do a magazine. I don't even know where, why, why the calendar over time had turned into a magazine other than you can't tell stories in a calendar. And for me, it was like I was encountering so many amazing different stories. And so it's free. That's my, my long end way of getting to THC magazine is free. Free. So I try to get it to as many tribally operated dispensaries across the nation, or I shouldn't say as many, I, they all. So um, the way that people can get it, generally speaking, is at www.indigenouscannabiscoalition.com. And the Indigenous Cannabis Coalition, as I mentioned earlier, is who publishes, uh, you know, distributes THC magazine. And the reason free is we wanted, you know, the education and the advocacy uh, to be able to get in the hands of our elders and to build bridges from one community to the next. And so on our website, you know, we also have a donation button for people to help support the cost of print publication. It's it's not cheap getting out 10,000 magazines each quarter, uh, you know, as well as the, the cost of producing them. Uh, you know, but we, we do what we can to keep our costs as low as possible and, you know, get really get really creative in, in how we we try to evolve uh, into the digital platform. But um, the the hardest part that I've found now is, you know, I, I have boxes and boxes of rece uh, receipts from where we had taken our magazine during the first three quarters where I just had my distribution folks, which is actually my mom and my niece, and they just pack up boxes and just put labels on them and they're shipping them out all over the nation, but we had never actually been mapping them, doing any of that quality work on the back end of, you know, showing what percentage was going to which uh, geographic regions, and we just started doing that with our latest issue of the magazine, and so I'm totally rookie. I'm making it all up as I go along. The, the creator is definitely looking out for, you know, for the, the, the work as it happens because everything just, everything is, it, 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 it is, it's just, it's working and it's been amazing. The hands that touch the creation of this magazine are some really beautiful people that just care about story. 
it, it's a family affair. <laughs> Go ahead, Dal. It, yeah, it is. It is, and you know, to be able to do a publication and and get the, get the family involved and get it distributed out there, it's important. And like I said, tracking to give you an idea of where it's being distributed and where it's going, uh, it's nice to know uh, where it, where it can end up at. That's for sure. Um, yeah. I do have I do have another one of those weird questions for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I think I think it's quite the achievement um, to give our listeners a bit of an idea of you know what you've achieved. You, you're talking about it all this time, but I think when the president of of the United States um, recognizes your your efforts and the work that you've done, I think that's quite an achievement. And I thought I'd bring that <laughs> up tonight. That. Uh, former President Obama, he appointed you to the national to a national advisory council on Indian education. Yes, um, a skeleton in my closet is yes. I am a former appointee to the Obama administration's NACI Council, or as you mentioned, the National Advisory Council on Indian Education. I served as the youngest appointee on the council, and. Uh, it, we did some phenomenal work. We went uh, full throttle on the um, White House uh, executive order on American Indian Alaska Native education. Uh, we were told by a lot of the, the lawyers within the United States Department of Education that it was going to take us a couple of years to really, you know, grapple out what the nuances of this is going to look like. And we did it within 10 months. Wow. 10 months. They thought it would take longer. But... Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. I. I. I uh, when I read that in that information, uh, the, and Julie always supplies, supplies good information on her guests. I thought, geez, that's that's awesome. Uh, that somebody. And I think, I, as far as I know, you're probably the first guest ever that I know has been ever been a presidential appointee into something. So. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was some pretty amazing time for sure. As, yeah. you know, I was serving as the youngest president of the the National Indian Education Association at the time, yeah. and that's truly I appreciate you bringing that up because that's also where I felt like I have to utilize the authority that was created by my positions in leadership yeah. as a servant leader throughout tribal communities where people had, you know, trust in what I was saying exactly. and, and really, as I said, come out of my own closet and bring that forward and where people can say, wow, she was doing all of that while she was also on, you know, the NACI council or while she was serving as NIA president or while she was doing this or that, you know, where mm. people can't. Yeah. 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 Congratulations. Yeah. yeah. I was, I was, Still successful despite having to be in a closet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, Julie, you got yeah, any more Yeah, I know you work. Go ahead. Well, no, I just wanted to say, I mean, it's amazing. And even thinking about what we're seeing in the last couple of weeks with this ridiculousness, um, oh, yes. I'm so happy. I'm so happy that you have, that, that, that those seeds were planted in you and that you have you know, continued on this pathway to say we must use this this platform and this voice uh, to actually create systemic positive change mm -hmm. within our communities that will be lasting. Uh, and I know that's what you're fighting for, is to, to create a more lasting, uh, healthful foundation for your people uh, and for all the Native peoples and, and for all of us. It's going to benefit everyone. Um, if everyone is invited to the table, isn't it? You know, all of the rich white guys and how they figure out how they all benefit from this tax scheme, you know, it will eventually come to a point where people will see that when, when it is eventually regulated like tomatoes, as it should mm -hmm. be, they, they, you know, this reefer madness caused, you know, us to all endure a really, a really crazy phase of this, this whole conversation about decrim and legalization it's like mother earth is not a criminal that's who's growing that's who's growing this plant <laughs> and she's not a criminal. yes and she wants it everywhere i mean as an herbalist you know it's the weeds we love the weeds because the weeds we call them weeds it's a it's a misnomer Yay. you know it's it, it, the weeds are the ones 
there's so many beneficial weeds from cannabis to burdock to to you know uh, all of the wonderful plants that we can can work with. So uh, you're right. <laughs> They're going, we're going to look back on this time period as just an insane period. That's why I like to call it a renaissance because this is the dark age. We're in the dark ages still where industry is being held back. We should be printing everything on hemp. We should be making everything with hemp uh, fibers. I, I, I want to print skunk on hemp. I want, uh, yes. you know, us to, right? I, I, we want to do this. So, so yeah, we're going to look on back on this period as an extremely dark age where evolution uh, was held back in the name of greed, in the name of business as usual, uh, which is ending. And we know it's ending, Mary Jane. So we got to keep on hitting it strong. Um, and so, yeah, if there's anything else you want to say, I know for my part, I just want to say, uh, you know, everyone, thank you for coming with us tonight. Um, thanks for listening in. And check out skunkmagazine.com. Um, we are going to be launching the forums soon. Um, it's happening. Um, we're in process, and we're very excited for the, the global community to come and participate with us there. Uh, Mary Jane, we definitely want to be speaking about Native um, stories and, and, and Native uh, issues and the evolution of the industry for Native people um, in there. Uh, in the forums, and so that's one thing that I want people to to pay attention to in the next uh, coming weeks, six to six to seven weeks. It's going to be coming. Uh, so that's the, the announcement for Skunk that I wanted to make tonight. Um, but Mary Jane, uh, it's just been such a pleasure to spend time with you and to hear more of your story, and to hear all of the beautiful things that you're doing. I really, really appreciate you coming on tonight. Well, Alan, Julie, thank you so much for having me. And definitely I want folks to, to check out our free download at the indigenouscannabiscoalition.com. And if you're interested in following any of my personal antics and the crazy stories behind uh, Mary Jane, uh, you can follow me uh, on Instagram at Mary Jane underscore flower girl. Ah, that's where you were hiding. I tried to find you on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> and the one that was oh, turning up... Oh, shopping wh videos. Yeah, well, yeah hey. <laughs> well, the one that I saw wasn't chopping wood. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I only had one post. Uh, oh, this can't be the right person. This can't be the right person. All righty. Um, no, 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 I post no. plenty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I figured. <laughs> All right. Uh, just a reminder that everybody know that we'll be back next week with uh, joint host uh, Kim Cooper. Uh, she is appearing next week. Because, uh, Julie, you were going to be scheduled, but you're you're headed somewhere, aren't you? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a judge for the Emerald Cup. Um, and so they have asked me if I would be uh, participating in uh, an Emerald Cup uh, judges panel. Uh, and so I'm going to be participating in that. And that's why I'm thankful that Kim could uh, cover for me. Um, so, yeah, that's what I'm up to <laughs> with oh, the Emerald Cup. Take us with you. Take us with you. <laughs> yes, so everybody, you know, go and check out the theemeraldcup.com. Um, uh, Tim and Taylor Blake are good friends. And I'm very honored to be a judge this year. I was a judge in the tincture category. And as an herbalist, I use tinctures every day. Uh, I believe in tincture medicine. Uh, and so I was very pleased and, and thankful that I got to judge that. And uh, I'm excited for the results. And so, yeah, that's what I'm up to, Al. So no. thank you, Kim Cooper. Shout out to Kim <laughs> for covering my uh, my show next week. Good stuff. Good stuff. All right. Just uh, let's see. Uh, you can find me Pace Radio Network on Twitter. We're also on uh, Instagram and we're on Facebook. Uh, let's see. Thank you to our sponsors. Uh, Legacy420.com, BMAHydroponics.com, Callenford Lifestyle Shop in downtown Callenford, as well as Dr. Buck Cam uh, Cannabis Trimming Solutions found at DrBuckCTS.com. And as always, a big thank you to our guest. And tonight, that was Mary Jane Oatman, which she has many hats on. 
Uh, thank you, Mary Jane, for coming tonight and talking to our listeners and telling us everything that you did today. Thank you for having me. It was it was so much fun. Uh, look forward to you coming back again because I know Julie will be making sure of that. And as always, Julie, thank you for everything you do and uh, and uh, you know continue what you're doing at Skunk. It's fantastic. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Mary Jane. And thank you, everyone who tuned in tonight. That's right. And good night. The opinions of the individuals during this broadcast are their own and may not be the opinions of their group or other organizations they may be involved with. You're listening to the Pace Radio Network here at paceradio.net. Do you want to hear what patients and cannabis advocates have to say? If so, then catch the Pace Radio Show Wednesday nights here on paceradio.net. We are people advocating cannabis education here at paceradio.net.